Hello, it's Ernesto. Welcome back to this series where I go over my ultimate template and how it's all put together. This is part two of the ultimate template tour. I'm going to be talking about the routing and the mixing for my template. So I won't speak to any of the organization of the template because I already talked about that in the last video. I highly implore you to go check that out so you know kind of what I'm talking about and you know the lay of the land first then come back and watch this video. A huge reason this template is so helpful is not only that all of my sounds are already in here, but they're already set up and routed and mixed so that as soon as I start routing music, it sounds amazing and I can print each of the stems individually. I can print a full mix. I can print a mastered version of the mix. All of that is available super fast because everything is set up beforehand. This will literally save you hours that would be better spent composing. I also, for the sake of brevity, have to assume that you understand the basics of mixing. That includes uh, the flow of audio concerning channels, uh, buses, sends, and returns. I also won't be explaining mixing concepts like what an EQ is or how a compressor works. I am assuming that you know all of that stuff already. If some of the things that I talk about in this video kind of go over your head. I encourage you to re-watch it over and over again until the concepts start to really sink in. Especially if you're just starting out with this kind of thing, this can get really confusing. But as you learn more and you practice more, you start to really understand it. And uh, as you re-watch this, you'll internalize a lot more of the things that I'm saying. This is how it happened for me. Also, if you want this template for yourself, I make it available over on Patreon for score level members. So if you want it, go ahead and join the family. All of that said, let's get into how the routing and mixing is set up for my ultimate template. Okay, so the first thing for you to get a grasp on is this concept of multiple layers when it comes to the function of how things are routed. So in the first layer, we have the bottom layer. These are all of the instruments. This is what you use to make up your arrangement. This includes violins or flutes or pads or drums. Anything that you literally write, that's the first layer, that's the arrangement. These are then routed to level two. In level two, there are the sub mixes. So one sub mix is a group of related instruments routed to one sub mix. For example, one sub mix could be all of the strings long. This is every string instrument that is playing in a long style. That's all routed to one sub mix. Parallel to the sub mixes are the effects. The effects tracks are generally for, in my case, reverbs. So I have a longer reverb for longer style playing and I have a short reverb for short style playing. This is a basic example. Now all of the sub mixes are bussed to these effects tracks, which in most cases has the reverb. So layer one, all of your instruments. Layer two, the submixes and the effects. Submixes go to the effects and then they both are routed to the third layer, which are the stems. The stems are all of the submixes and the effects put together. So to continue this example, if your violins, your violas, your cellos, your basses, those are all of your instruments. All of the legato styles of those instruments are routed to a strings long submix. Then all of the staccatos, for example, for each of those instruments are routed to a strings short submix, etc. Those two submixes have a reverb that it is sending to. So all of the strings long are sending audio to the long reverb and all of the strings short are sending to the short reverb. Then all of those tracks are being routed to the stem. The stem is just a strings stem. So it doesn't matter whether it's long, doesn't matter whether it's short or anything else. If it's a string instrument, it'll be routed to the stem. Now stems are important because these are what you send to an editor or a dubbing engineer to put into the final master version of the project with the entire soundtrack. This includes dialogue, this includes sound effects and your music. The stems are important because it allows them to be able to control the volume for individual stems as they need to alter things for the final mix. So for example, if they need to lower the volume of the booms or sound design stuff that you added in, they can do that. Or all of the percussion instruments, if they're too heavy, they can lower the volume just a little bit so that it fits within the overall package very nicely. So those are the three layers, instruments, 
submixes and effects, and then stems. All of the stems are also routed to the mix bus, so you can print all of the stems together, which is technically your whole arrangement. But let's get into the template itself to show you how this is laid out on my end. So here's my template again. And how about I just pull up a mixer here to show you what I got. So let me open my string stack. Here are all of my strings, violins, second violins, violas, celli, basses. Now these are broken up separately, even though they're the same instrument, they're broken up between legato, longs, shorts, pizzicato and colenio, and effects. This is so that they're bust to their proper place. So let me show you. In terms of naming, and I talked about this in the last video, the naming scheme I have for the whole stem 0, 0600 strings. Now you'll notice here, these instruments, because legato and longs are long style playing, they're bust to 66. Now let's go find 66. Here it is. This is titled 0601 strings long. Makes sense, right? Here are all of the submixes. I have submixes in this case for longs, the shorts, this is for pizzicato and colenio, and this is for the effects. The effects in this context is just for like tremolos or atonal effects or uh, special effects that you play, stuff that isn't really typical and that you might want to control differently in when you're mixing. Each of these instruments are routed appropriately to these submixes. Now, these sends right here are these tracks that I said are in parallel. These are numbered 0611 to 0615. You'll notice that the six is the sort of fruit through line between all of this. The bus numbers are even sixes. In this case, they're in the 60s, but that's how organized this is to a T. So here I have a reverb. This is my long reverb. So this is sending this much to this reverb. The shorts as well are sending to this short reverb over here. So that's bus 62. The input for this one is bus 62. That's how I know that everything is routed correctly. All of these, you'll notice, have an output of bus 60. So all of the submixes and the effects tracks are routed to bus 60. What is bus 60? It happens to be this track right here, bus 60. This is the stem. So what you hear coming out of this stem is all of the submixes and the effects together all at once. This is then routed to a full mix stem, which is bus 255 in this case. So that's basically how it works for every single stem in my template. And it's pretty much organized the same way like this. So let's open one up. So bus 10 in the woodwinds is the stem itself. Bus 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 are effects, 16, 17, 18, 19 are the submixes. The submixes and effects are routed to bus 10. And because in logic, each of these stems are summing stacks, these folders can send audio and can be altered and everything like that. So summing stacks are not only for organization, but they can also be used for routing and such. So that's at the individual stem level. Now, each of these stems are routed to bus number 255. Let's go find bus 255. Here it is. Bus 255 is my mix track. I have one plugin on here. This is the multimeter. This is just so I analyze how loud it is, basically. Uh, I don't open this much, but I have it just in case. You'll also notice that this has no output. So if you soloed this track, you wouldn't hear anything because it's not going anywhere. Here's how it works though. You'll see that it's sending to two different tracks, bus 256 and bus 251. Let's take a look at bus 256. This is pre-fader, which means that if you alter the fader right here, it won't change the volume that is coming out, it'll just be zero. So bus 256 happens to be right here, which is the mastered track. What this is for is so that if you need to send a mastered version of your track. For example, you might want to put it up as a demo on your portfolio or on a website, or send it as a demo to a director or producer, or even want to put it out on an album for your, for your soundtrack, then you can add everything to this mastered track and it won't affect your initial mix. So you can have them both separate. So that's why the mix sends to the mastered 
you can put your plugins on the master track and then you have a mastered version. You'll also notice that this also has no output. So if you soloed this, you wouldn't hear anything as well. But how do you hear it? Now, that's where we get to bus 251 and bus 252. Again, these are uh, sent to zero decibels, as you can see right here. The little send is blue and it's also on the left side. In logic, this means that this is also pre-fader. So it sends to another bus before it gets to the fader, which if I altered the volume here, you would still hear the master at full volume because it's before the fader. So let me reset that. Bus 251 and 252 are in my template at the very top here under MX Mother. MX stands for music and sound design. Here is bus 251 and bus 252. This right here, 251 is my mix monitor. You can mute your mix and listen to only the master which is bus 252, which is what the mastered is being sent to. These two tracks, their sole purpose is just so you can hear back the music. You don't do anything else with these faders. So you don't print these, you don't do anything except for mute and unmute what you do or don't want to listen to at a time. So to recap really quick, the mix is sending to 256, which is the mastered track right here, but also to 251 which is the mix monitor. And then the mastered track is going only to 252, the mastered monitor. 90% of the time you'll be listening to the mix because that's how you should work. At the very end, if you want to export a mastered version, then you mute the mix and unmute the mastered monitor so you can hear everything that's going on. So don't forget that. That's also why both of these outputs are routed to the stereo output. So all of the stems are sent to the mix, the mix is sent to the mix monitor, and the mix monitor is sent to the stereo out. That's how you hear all of this. If you muted your mix monitor, you wouldn't be able to hear anything. Likewise, the dialogue, sound effects, and temps tracks are also routed to just the stereo out, so they don't go through the mix monitor. So if you wanted to mute the music, you just mute, say, the music uh, monitor track here, and then you can hear just the dialogue, or mute the film audio and listen only to your music. The sketch track is also just routed to stereo output, so this doesn't get printed by anything. You can hear it, you can mute that on its own, and you don't have to mess with the whole music monitor. So the sketch track is kind of its own thing where you can play around with sort of like a musical sandbox, if you will. You can mute that, solo that as you want to, but it's unrelated to the rest of the arrangement. That's not the purpose of the sketch track to contribute to your overall arrangement. It's just for you to write initial ideas down on. If you want to have those piano sounds, put it in your main arrangement. All right, so that's the routing, basically, in a nutshell. Along with that are all of these print tracks. Now, one of my favorite features of this template is that I can print every stem individually. I can print the whole mix. I can print the master. I can print the metronome. I can print the submixes on their own if I need to do so super easily because again, it's all set up beforehand. So here is the print tracks for the woodwinds. So we have more summing stacks. This is print 0, 100. This is the same blue color and naming scheme as the woodwinds stem. So it's good to have that kind of continuity between not only the instruments themselves, but also the print tracks. I find that so helpful, but this is just going to the stereo output in terms of how you're hearing it. So these are all muted. They just record the, the tracks they're not routed to the output so that you can hear them if that makes sense. All right, so in this stack, I have 0, 0100 wins stem. This is the print track for the stem. You'll notice that its input is bus 10. Bus 10 is this right here, the woodwind stem. Bus 10 is where that is. These right here are the print tracks for the submixes, winds long, short effects, and solo. Their inputs happen to be the inputs for the submixes that I have, 16, 17, 18, 19, here in the stack, 16, 17, 18, 19. Because you're getting the submixes directly, this is before they get to the effects, so when you print the submixes, you won't get any reverbs printed on it. This is kind of an industry standard because usually you'll send your submixes to a 
mixer and a mixer will want full control over their own reverbs and delays and they probably have better plugins than you do so you send them versions like this you could print reverbs on their own you would just create new stacks set their input to the effects tracks that you have from the stem and you can print them on your own i just haven't set that up in my template here so this all is has an output of bus number one and this is bus number one. That same scheme is followed throughout basically the rest of the other instruments for the brass, the orchestral percussion, the harp and keys, etc. which as you can imagine, takes a long time to set up. I also have these print tracks for the full mix and the full mix mastered right here. So these inputs happen to be the mix monitor and the mastered monitor. So you can print just the full mix. Lastly, I have this track here, 0001 clicks. This is for the click track. If I open this utilities folder, I have a couple more tracks in here. So this is the click track. This is specifically so I can print the metronome. If I go back to the arrangement window and let me open screen set five for printing so you can see this right here is the print track. There are just a ton of these little metronome sounds across pretty much the entire arrangement for a long time. What you want to do is just unmute that. You'll hear a click. And if you want to print the click, since this is routed to the click track, you just put it in record, start it from the beginning. And if you record, you'll record all of these into its own dedicated track. So if you needed to print the metronome, then there's that option as well. Lastly, we've got these two tracks, sync plop, and this is plop two. The sync plop is a little blip that's at the very, very beginning of the project, which is routed to all of the stems. So this is bus 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. This is from the woodwinds to the strings. And then the same for the non-orchestral instruments, which happen to be 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. There's only one track that has the audio file. This sync plop is just outputting to this plop two track, and this has no output, so you don't hear it twice, but this is just so that it can send to the other stems without having to create like a longer list here in this bus section, if that makes sense. So that's the printing. Now let's get into the mixing. Everything is set up basically so that as soon as I start writing music, it already sounds wonderful because I have EQs on it. I have reverbs on it. I have effects, all kinds of things. And I'll show you basically how I have mine set up. Let's open the strings again, because this is a pretty easy way to show off what, it, what we've got here. Remember our first layer, the instrument layer. On the instruments, especially these orchestral instruments, I have just one plugin on them, and this is a basic EQ. I use the built-in Logic EQ because I like having the little thumbnail there and I don't need any other EQ other than this. So this is just a clean EQ and all I'm doing is cutting out frequencies that I don't need. This is what I call my corrective EQ. So I'm cutting out the low end because as the samples get triggered, they're basically little audio files and you hear pretty much the whole frequency spectrum and you hear the sound of the room, you know, reverberating, doing what rooms do just naturally. The problem is, in sample library land that as you trigger all of those samples, the sound of the room gets duplicated each time that you trigger a sample, basically. And that starts to really build up and it's hard to identify outright. But once you cut out all of that stuff that you don't need for the higher instruments, it makes a huge difference in leaving space for all of the bass instruments to come through because the sound of the room isn't muddying up those frequencies. So you probably wouldn't want to cut out the low frequencies if you're recording live with microphones and they're not samples that are being triggered, no matter whether they're high strings or low strings or short sounds or long sounds or anything like that. But in this sample library land, I've got these EQs basically on most instruments. Most of the bass instruments, I don't have an EQ on it because I'm not cutting most most of that stuff out. But for these violins, I've got mm, about 125 hertz, looks like, below cutout. You'll notice I have an EQ on almost every instrument track. Now, let's check out the submix for the lungs. You'll notice I have another EQ here. 
This, I sort of just am cutting out a few more frequencies. I can't remember how I came to this point, but I just made it like this sometime and then I left it like that. Who knows if I'll keep this, but that's it. Now, underneath that, we have another EQ. This is the API 550A. This is what it looks like when you pull up the EQ for the first time. These are not the settings that I have on here. I mentioned in the last video, but I got my EQ settings from a mentor of mine, Trevor Morris. He shared the kind of EQ that he has on his submixes. This is the same EQ. His He uses the one from Universal Audio, but since I don't have a UAD box or anything like that, I just got this API from Waves. If you don't want to purchase one, Logic actually has a good emulation of this built in under EQ, the Vintage EQ Collection. The vintage, I believe it's the console EQ. Yes, this right here. So this is the same thing as this. So if you just play around with the frequencies that you're doing, the um, gain amount, you'll find something that you really like. There are only three bands to play with. So play around with this so that your overall sound for your strings sounds really great. Underneath this EQ, I have this multi-band compressor. So I have two bands right here, two frequencies that I'm kind of compressing. Mostly down here because after the EQ, I'm boosting a lot of the lows. I don't want that to get too overwhelming. So I have this compressor from the 200 and lower range so that if it starts getting over a certain threshold, it kind of controls the volume a little bit over here. I also have another band over here near the 2K past the 5K realm for the higher frequencies. So like if the violins start playing really loudly, this frequency range is kind of the range that where when you're listening to it, it can kind of hurt your ears if it gets too loud. So this kind of balances out the EQ in, in a lot of ways. This is the Pro MB by Fab Filter, by the way, fantastic plugin. And I kind of follow the same idea for these other ones for the pizzicatos i also have this uh, pro mb on it to get the lows kind of a little lower this right here kind of to open up or expand the higher range which i think adds a nice quality when you're hearing pizzicato in in this case and a little ducking for the middle frequencies as well this is kind of um yeah this is a preset that i that i put up that i thought worked but I also have the same EQ and then the channel EQ across all of these. These submixes are sent to these uh, two reverbs. So the reverb I'm using is Cinematic Rooms by Liquid Sonics. This I also picked up on the recommendation of Trevor Morris, and I also use his settings for this. So I'm not going to share it with you out of respect for him, but this is what it comes up with when you first launch it anyway. And this is such a great sounding preset in itself. You can leave it like this and it'll it'll just sound amazing. Of course, there are all kinds of presets that you can find and you can play around with the reverb time and all of this other stuff. So also pro tip, since you're sending mounts, just set the mix in the plugin to all the way 100% wet and then you control how much or how little of the reverb you want in, in the sound. So you control that here, not in the plugin itself. So I have two reverbs, one with a longer reverb tail, one with a shorter reverb tail. This is to let the longs kind of be a little more splashy and it just sounds more hyped up, like it's, it's a more hyped up kind of reality. And for the shorts, like the shorts here, like spiccato or staccato playing or even the pizzicatos and such like that i send to the short reverb the short reverb is a shorter reverb time so that if you hear a pluck sound it just doesn't last forever it lasts more appropriately and this is kind of a way to really dial in a great sound when it comes to this kind of stuff and on most of my orchestral tracks I have this same scheme. So let me open the brass, why don't we? If I wanted to take a look at these trombones, let me turn this 
on. Let's check out the EQ here. We'll see, I, I've kind of dipped down uh, some of those higher frequencies on the trombones, only because trombones are so bright and forward that I wanted to tame them just a little bit. So I cut out those high, high frequencies in the trombone. It doesn't alter the sound or make it sound too muted in any way, but it does just tame those higher frequencies so it doesn't so it doesn't mess with the trumpets as much. Trombones are bright, that's part of their character and that's part of their quality. That's how you should consider them. But in terms of mixing, just wanted to dip them down a little bit. So I've got here a brass long. I have the same EQ and I also have another uh, compressor here. These are just so that I can dip down the higher frequencies of maybe the horns or the trumpets. If they get too loud, they start not peaking, but they start getting so loud that it starts to hurt your eardrums a little bit. These will dip down the volume just enough. I've also got my long reverb and my short reverb. I believe my long reverb for the brass is slightly shorter than my long reverb for the strings. So I didn't want that same like super long sound on the brass. I didn't think that it sounded good. And I have even less of a short reverb for the short verb for the brass as well. You'll notice again that all of my instruments have the corrective EQ on them, whether they're just cutting out low frequencies in the trumpets or cutting out the high frequencies in the trombones, all that stuff uh, I already have set up here. Let's open some of these synth tracks for a change. So I've got stacks of my leads, arps high, arps low, and basses. Here are their submixes. You'll notice that I don't have any plugins on these submixes at all because it's kind of a case by case basis with synthesizers and synthesizers like the instrument tracks themselves might have their own effects on there. So let me open the leads here. And so I got a couple leads here where I added a ton of effects. So that kind of thing is just on a case by case basis. On the arps, here I've got it sent to this reverb. This reverb looks like tight synth reflection, which is chroma verb built into logic. I kind of just were, was adding this reverb for those short sounds the, for the arps, but otherwise I'm not really sending many effects. These other three effects tracks, by the way, A, you can use them to maybe stick a, a delay of some kind or any other kind of time-based effect. Or you can just add more reverbs onto here. They're not titled verb, but they can be whatever you want them to be. So you don't just have to have two reverbs, you can have five reverbs and be sending them to different submixes as you see appropriately. But this, I liked sticking to these two reverbs and then the other three are the kind of specialty cases. So for example, let me take you over to the harp and keys. So here on the harp, I have a compressor as well as this EQ, but you'll notice that I'm sending to this reverb over here and also to this track 43, which is a delay. This is a timeless three by Fab Filter. I found a preset I suppose that I liked so that for certain stuff, I might want to have just a little bit of a delay sound. And there are two ways that I use a harp. Let me open the plugin itself. So you'll see with this mix, I have some of this close mic and a lot of this stereo mic that gives it a really nice sound. Let me sh show you just a little bit. So that's some of the harp mic'd really closely, but in an orchestral context, you might want to just stick with this first mix and that gives you a different sound. It, the sound is from further away. I have this gain plugin uh, here just to boost the volume of the harp if I need to, but if I'm in this orchestral context, and I'll turn this off so that it sounds more balanced or more realistic to what a harp would actually sound like if you were listening to it within the full orchestra. I have this gain plugin that I can turn on and off whenever I need to just change the sound a little bit. So I also have a compressor here to get some of those peaks a little lower and this delay in case I want to send it to a nice shimmery delay if I have it close mic'd and I also have it gained a little bit. Sometimes you wanna use a harp in a more intimate kind of context and a subtle delay adds a lot of character. You'll also notice each of these stems has a limiter on it. This limiter isn't doing anything other than adding three decibels of gain. This is just to 
boost the volume of everything a little, a little higher, only by three decibels, so that the overall mix is just a little uh, beefier and closer to the speakers. Also notice for the print stems, I also have this limiter so that when you print it, it prints at the same volume that the overall stem was at. So these are the just the exact same settings that I have on these individual stems. Other than that, the other sort of mixing consideration that I have is here on the mastered track, you'll notice up here under settings, I have this channel strip setting called no master. If I go over here to user channel strip settings, I have one that I've made mastering plugin chain. If I click this, check out what happens. Boom, a bunch of these plugins suddenly appear. This is sort of the mastering chain that I launch whenever I want to have something quote unquote mastered. So here I've got an EQ. This is the AMEC EQ 200 from Plugin Alliance. This is the black box analog design again from Plugin Alliance. This is for some nice saturation. This is the Saturn 2 from Fel Fab Filter to add just a little more, more of a warm tape sound. This is the Shadow Hills Class 8 Mastering Compressor, again from Plugin Alliance. This is a really nice open sounding compressor to just add a little bit of glue. I use Ozone 9 to really get my levels up and also as a multi-band compressor here. I also just open up the, the stereo width of the mids very subtly, but I am just opening that space up. And lastly, I have this Pro L2 as a final limiter and just to bring it up to a comfortable listening level that is decent for just streaming or for overall listening. And then at the very bottom, I have this multimeter to keep track of correlation. Is everything nice and, you know, feeling centered? This goniometer uh, to get a look at my overall spread. The spectrum analyzer lets me see where the energy is and the low or the high frequencies or if everything's looking pretty good. And the overall volume of everything together. Don't ask me too many questions about this. I am not a mastering engineer. I don't claim to be as well. So this could be completely completely off the mark. It is a lot of plugins, but they're each doing very small, subtle things. So it's not like it's a ton of stuff, but I still would not tell you to copy my settings because I'm not sure what I'm doing quite yet. So I've also saved a channel strip of no master so that it gets rid of all of the plugins, but every all of the routing is still intact. As soon as I got that figured out, it, it helped me with adding new plugins to the mastering chain because whenever I would add something and then want to get rid of the whole mastering chain, I had to reroute everything appropriately again. So I've got no master. And then if I ever want to pull up my mastering chain, I just open it here in the channel strip settings. Okay, so let me show you what it sounds like with none of the mixing, and adding the mixing back in. So this includes my individual settings for each instrument, like those corrective EQs, and also the settings for the submixes and the reverbs. So let me just write something really quickly, show you what it sounds like without any effects, EQs, compressors, reverbs, all of that. And then I'll add all of that back in to show you the difference. I got this sounding to a good place that I like so that as soon as I'm writing the music, it sounds incredible. And then all I have to do at the end is tweak what I need to and then print it, send it off on its way. All right, so that's it for this video. If you have any more questions, do let me know and I'll do my best to try and answer all of them. I'm sure I missed something in here that is essential, but I tried to be as in-depth as I could be without 
getting too complicated or anything like that. The next video, we'll talk about how you can use this template from beginning to end for your entire process or how I use it for my entire process. So stick around for that. And until next time, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Ernesto Composer. You can visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash Ernesto Composer. You can get access to templates like this one right here, score study versions of my own published works, score study Sunday hangouts every single month and more goodies. You can visit my website at ErnestoComposer.com. Thank you so very much for watching. And as always, take care.